Well, welcome, welcome, welcome everybody. Um, it's wonderful to see so many people join us for this very special Soapbox event, which is here to celebrate 30 years of teaching psychology at Griffith. Um, my name is David Newman, and it's been my privilege to be the current head of school for the School of Applied so Psychology at Griffith. And I'll be your MC for the Soapbox event in which we have a range of very special guests who will be giving us their insights about the past, the present, and the future of teaching psychology. Now, our guests span from the one who actually started it all in terms of teaching psychology at Griffith, all the way through to a soon-to-be graduating honours candidate who represents an outstanding example of what the next generation of psychology holds in store. Now, the discussion we will have today promises to be thought-provoking, uh, inspiring, surprising, and dare I say it, remarkable. But before we begin, I would just like to acknowledge for us to uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land in which we gather and pay our respect to elders past and present and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Now let me give you a brief overview of the program that we've got for today. We've got three guest speakers and then we'll conclude with a panel discussion. Our first guest speaker is Professor John O'Gorman, who among other things, he'll be sharing his insights about the emergence of psychology as a discipline at Griffith. He'll be followed by Professor Annalisa Donovan, who's the current Dean Academic of the Health Group and was instrumental in setting up the clinical postgraduate program here at Griffith. Following Annalise is Professor Paul Martin, who's former head of school and was crucial in sharpening the focus of our school name and the emphasis of our degrees on applied psychology. We will then finish off with a panel discussion. And on our panel, we have a perfect blend of youth and experience and across the full diversity of areas relevant to teaching psychology. So they include Professor Sharon Dorr, Dr. Matt Stainer, Jacinta Horwood, and Lee, -Ann, uh, Lee, Lee Chantal Koch. And so without further ado, I would like to introduce our first guest speaker. I would like to introduce you to a leader who has been with us from the very beginning. Professor John O'Gorman began working as a psychologist in 1970, eventually finding his way to Griffith University, where he was appointed the Foundation Dean of the Faculty of Health and Behavioural Sciences in 1990. So this time coincided with Griffith offering their first psychology degree in the same year. And here we are 30 years later to celebrate 30 years of psychology at Griffith. Now, during his time as head, School of Applied Psychology, Professor O'Gorman developed an innovative psychology program that had an outstanding reputation for its excellence in teaching and as well as distinct applied focus. The program has been consistently ranked as one of the best two or three psychology programs in Australia on the basis of course experience surveys. So certainly starting from a very strong foundation. So Professor John O'Gorman played a very significant role in the development of psychology at Griffith. And as we are now celebrating our 30 years of teaching psychology, I would just like to invite John to reflect on, upon the early days of teaching psychology at Griffith. Thank you, John. Thanks, David. Uh, first, a few facts and then a few observations. Um, the first lecture was given on the 19th of February 1990 in Central Theatres 1 on the Nathan campus. Uh, there were 133 students there that day, and of those, uh, 64 were to graduate uh, in three years' time. Uh, the lecture was led by Arthur Brownlee, one of the founding fathers, they were all men, one of the founding fathers of Griffith. Um, in a what I would call Socratic style, which was uh, very well received by the students at the time. In attendance uh, were uh, Bryony Thompson, a senior lecturer who had come across from QUT, Dale Caird, uh, a lecturer who had come across from uh, Queensland, 
uh, Martin Grimmer, also from Queensland, is a teaching fellow. Uh, David Shum, who was a part-time teaching fellow at that stage, and myself. Uh, um, Dale uh, was uh, uh, an accountant in his former life, and perhaps that's what led him in, into statistics, or as he called it, statistics, uh, in sympathy with his students. With that uh, sympathetic touch, HRM sent him an invitation to a retirement seminar the day he arrived at Griffith. We get uh, some more experience of that over the years. Uh, so much for the for the facts of the beginning. Some observations. Uh, firstly, there were fairly severe time constraints. I arrived just before Christmas. The others arrived at Griffith uh, early in the new year and we were teaching in uh, February. Uh, so we had about six to eight weeks to get ready. Uh, from then on, it was pretty helter skelter, teaching the first year, getting ready for the second year, thinking ahead to accreditation. An honours program had to come online in 93 and then the uh, master's program in 94. Uh, so it was... Uh, very busy times, uh, talk about building the aircraft while flying it, and the DVC uh, weighed in with a question to us about why we weren't doing more research. As well as those time constraints, there were resource constraints. Uh, the, there was no forward planning for the program, uh, and the best that could be done in the last uh, three months of uh, 89 was to build in uh, the Undercroft in the new Asian and International Studies building to put in some offices. We actually got our staff offices the day we began teaching. And we got the doors to those offices the following week. It was also the case that uh, desktop computers were not a uh, general issue in those days. Uh, academic staff a member could have one if they had the consulting funds to buy one or they could make out a case justifying the need. So we set up a worthiness a subcommittee to examine the case for each of the staff members to have a computer on their desk. Now, I know this begins to sound a bit like that Monty Python skit, The Four Yorkshiremen. If uh, you've seen it, you know that, uh, that each of the four tries to uh, outdo the other in terms of the miserable an impoverished childhood that they had. Uh, one would say, for example, um, uh, we lived in one room, all 26 brothers and sisters. And another would come in over the top and say, one room, luxury. We lived in shoebox in Middle to Road. Uh, so I don't want to um, try to uh, exaggerate, but it was pretty uh, straightened times. The other observation I would make was the major challenge for us was uh, finding a path between Griffarian orthodoxy and the dictates of the APS. Griffith was an alternative university. It was uh, interdisciplinary. It, it was uh, problem oriented uh, and it was nothing like uh, a conventional university. And it changed the names of everything to make sure nobody was confused about that. The APS, on the other hand, uh, was uh, very much used to conventional universities and the sorts of programs that they accredited were very conventional programs. We had to uh, try to find a, a way to um, moderate both their demands and the demands of uh, Griffith. We finally did in 1992, in November, the Academic Board approved a School of Applied Psychology. Uh, we found uh, we could get our courses accredited if anything that we taught that might be useful to the students was uh, kept without a psychology number. That is, we would have a, a stream, as it was called, or a major in change agency, and we would have a separate major in psychology and never the twain shall meet. So we could teach students things that they might be able to use working in organisational and community contexts uh, without it being called psychology. Uh, we uh, 
we got all our courses uh, accredited and they were accredited the day that the students graduated. So that uh, was I think, something of an achievement. Uh, looking back, it was uh, challenging times. The best uh, of it, of course, was that uh, it was a small group, uh, a lot of camaraderie among staff, very good students. People had been lining up for a while to join this new program. They were people who would take a risk because it was an unaccredited program at that stage. They were bright. Uh, we were cutting off there about OP4, which was about the 83rd percentile. Uh, so there, there you have the recipe for academic satisfaction, uh, bright students in small numbers. So if I was asked if I'd do it all again, I'd love to. Thanks, David. Thank you very much for that um, wonderful insights, John. And um, it kind of really sounded like the Wild West for a while there as things were getting going. Uh, but, you know, we really appreciate that um, all you guys, you know, really persisted because, you know, after all, this is what we've got now, you know, a fantastic thriving school and a range of uh, undergraduate and postgraduate programs are the just reward. So thank you for those insights, John. I would now like to introduce our next guest speaker, um, who is a current Dean Academic of the Griffith Health Group. Um, Professor Annalise O'Donovan has witnessed our school grow during her time in Griffith, in which she has served as in several leadership positions within the school. Professor O'Donovan was the recipient of the Australian Award for University Teaching, which is from the Australian Learning and Teaching Council, and she continues to be highly sought after for her positive contributions to clinical psychology training, including supervision training, as well as her general academic leadership. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Annalise to say a few words. Thank you. Thanks so much, David, and thanks for inviting me. And it's so nice to see you, John. It's, it is like a walk in the past. Just listening to John talk, I probably joined the school a few years after you did, and I remember at my interview, one of the questions were, what experience did I have with administration? I remember the time thinking, what does he mean, administration? And like, of course, now if you're an academic, it's your life. So <laughs> how times have changed. So it was an amazing history and was back to the future, Nathan, then on to Mount Gravatt. And as some of you might know, now the plan is to move psychology from Mount Gravatt back to Nathan. So everything comes around. So I just want to say a few words, first of all, to the alumni and current students, because this is for you. Um, congratulations. Very smart choice. Studying psychology, I think, for all of us, like... What else can one study apart from psychology? It is so important, it's central to everything. Second fabulous choice you've all made is to do it at Griffith University and in the school. Having been around the school for quite some time, it's a great curriculum um, and the staff have always been passionate. There's been a lot of changes and everything, but there's always been a complete commitment in the school about the student experience. And I'm sure for all of you who are online um, and have already completed your studies, you know, you'd be hopefully reminiscing now about your time at uni and what was the stuff that really impacted the most for you. And, you know, was it all of the theories? Maybe. Um, certainly the knowledge you gained, the applied skills. I think that our school has always been really known for, for um, the skills training which has set aside quite a bit from other universities, the relationships you would have built, um, maybe the stats you did. Um, but right now, if you think back on all of those things that you learned and now no doubt applying in whatever area you're in, I really hope that you are left with a sense that everything you've learned, all of the relationships you've had, have really enriched not just your knowledge and skills, but actually who you are as a person. I think my education definitely did that for me, that um, I became a better person because of all the studies I've done, and in that way, more able to really help people, um, which is what psychology is all about. So, yes, enjoy, and thank you for inviting me, David. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Annalise. And, uh, 
really interesting to hear about that because often when we you know study psychology a lot of the focus is on you know exams and diving into the textbooks and stuff like that but really insightful to hear you talk about that is actually it is more than that you know it's about you know us developing as a person and our relationship with others so really appreciate your thoughts there now next um, I'd like to introduce Professor Paul Martin now having studied and worked in our field for over 50 years I can think of no one better in a or no one in a better position to reflect upon how the world of psychology has changed over the past 30 years Having trained at the University of Oxford before migrating to Australia and then teaching and conducting his research in a range of top tier universities and eventually becoming the head of school for psychology at Griffith University, Professor Paul Martin is in a position to give us some rich insights into our past. And more generally, Paul has watched the discipline of psychology grow while holding a number of senior leadership positions, such as in the Australian Behaviour Modification Association, the Australian Psychological Society and has been awarded with the Medal of the Order of Australia for his service to medicine in the field of psychology. So please join me in welcoming Professor Paul Martin to reflect upon applied psychology and how he has seen this area develop and what is in store for the future. Thanks Paul. Okay, look, thank you for that introduction, David. Although I must admit, I'm always fascinated with people's background to these, uh, these Skype Zoom sessions. And uh, I was a little bit worried seeing yours. It looks as though you're in prison. I, I trust that's wrong. That is wrong. It's just a, a background I've got here. It's all good. I'll be out. So. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to hear. Okay, so. When I was uh, sort of trying to collect my thoughts for the presentation today, I was looking back at, at some presentations I did when I was at Griffiths, and I was amused that I came across a slide from 2013, and it had this um, this picture up that said that was the year that was. And I thought, good Lord, well, if that was appropriate in 2013, imagine how appropriate it is as we come to the end of 2020 because certainly 2020 that was the year that was now I just thought I'd put up a quick slide here which uh, to capture my time at Griffith so I was at Griffith 2011 to 2017 in those seven years I was I was head of school for the first three and then professor on an intensive uh, research intensive after the remaining period prior to that yes I've been at Monash uh, are running the, the clinical program there, but also direct psychology of Southern Health. And then subsequently to Griffith, I was director of the research school at ANU. So, so that was my time at Griffith. Um, John's already talked a bit about the history. I don't want to talk too much about it. I just did one slide just to sort of try and put the history a little bit in perspective. So yes, 1990 was the, the beginning of psych teaching psychology 30 years ago. But Griffith as a university had been around for some years before. We at one stage had we were the only university in Australia that had two independent schools of applied psychology, uh, but they came together in 2005. And whilst the two schools have been called the schools of applied psychology, when they merged, they became the school of psychology. In 2011, we changed the name to uh, the school of applied psychology. It was a bit of a back to the future, but we wanted to create this uh, this niche reflecting uh, what we saw as a strength of the school, which was the application of psychological science. Now, when I was appointed, the executive of the university, what they basically said to me is they said, look, the Griffith School, uh, very strong on teaching, but we would, we have a few concerns in the research domain and, and so we'd like you to maintain the teaching excellence of the school, but we'd like you to, to try to lift the research performance of the school. So that was really my agenda. So they said the teaching of the school was good, but obviously we academics, we, we never take anyone at their word. We always uh, check it out. These are just a couple of slides that I used in the, uh, the first school retreat that I attended um, in, in 2011. And they just captured just how strong the School of Psychology was at, at, at 
teaching. Uh, there was no, you know, the, the exact were exactly right. Uh, the, the people in the school took their teaching very seriously. They got lots of awards and grants on. They were excellent. This is a slide from my final retreat as head of school uh, done in 2013. And it's the same old story. All these people getting awards, uh, very, very good. I haven't really monitored it very closely since no longer being head, but it all continued. So for example, right at the end of my headship, um, whilst the focus had been on lifting research reform, which we, which we certainly were able to do, um, in fact, we actually went forward in teaching performance too. This was a note I got from Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic, uh, the mean set score, score who improved again in 2013, an excellent result. And then, of course, Shirley got that very prestigious APS award in 2015. So. So yes, the, the history of the school and teaching is, is really very strong. I then want to try to move on to what I see as the real, the really big challenges that the, the, the school of psychology Griffiths faces, but then all schools uh, in, in Australia face at the moment. I imagine they're all ones you're familiar with, but I'll, I, and this one I want to speak to very briefly. So this is the fact that the Psychology Board of Australia are intending to do this review of the pathway to general integration in the next two years and then review the areas of practice endorsement the following two years, in other words, the specialist uh, years. So this is what we've got at the moment. There are all these different pathways towards general registration. Uh, a lot of people think that that's too confusing for everyone. There should be less. But I think a very important area for the school to really Think about this and decide uh, whether to introduce new degrees, cancel existing options and so on. I partly don't want to talk about it too much because there are lots of options, all with pros and cons. You've still got Shirley in the school who, with her background with APAC, is very expert in this area. And I know he's got some strong views about it. So I really want to flag it as a considerable importance rather than particularly make suggestions. Um, a huge Central threat to universities is this recently announced uh, change in university funding models. So fund, federal government released the Job Ready Graduate Package on 19th of June this year. At first glance, it looked good for psychology, 42% reduction in university fees for clinical, 18% for science, and we all, we all believe psychology is science. But it's, it's difficult to work out the implications because is only a small part of the degree people do. Um, then it gets more complicated because funding of courses is based on fields of education. My colleagues is classified under behavioral science, which is under scientific culture. So um, this all looks a bit of a worry, but it's not very clear. We have had a number of groups lobbying for how psychology fits into the system. The APS said, said psychology should be funded, the same band, band as science. And Hodsborough argued we should be funded the same band as Allied Health. And in fact, the government's accepted the Hodsborough proposal. So that's, that's sort of made uh, really a, a huge difference. Um, but there are still all sorts of queries in the model. I mean, for example, clinical psychology as defined by the government includes all the specialist areas except organizational psychology. So that's perhaps. Um, also, as psychology is only 40% of the undergraduate degrees, what about the other subjects that should be studying? I mean, we've got double degrees with law and commerce, and they've been um, subjected to significant increase in student fees. The demand may go down and so on. The changes in the university budget don't really impact for a couple of years. So most universities are waiting to hear a few more details, but I think this is an area that the universities need to look at very, very closely to see how they'll come out of it. Now, then there's all the COVID-19 driven changes. Um, you know, very recently we saw that modeling by the Mitchell Institute for a university predicted a 50% drop in international student numbers by, by mid-2021. So that's obviously a huge problem, more so for some universities than others. I've mentioned in my second dot point that I think they, when University of Melbourne looked at how much at risk different universities were from uh, the fee losses, uh, Griffiths was in the low risk category. 
and there are the other six Queensland universities. A couple of others are also low risk, UQ, QUT, and so on, are medium. Queensland's actually high risk. What about some of the other COVID 19 things? Well, um, Dr. Ruth Vine sees um, COVID as, a, as an opportunity for reform. Psychologists can now see clients via telehealth. This obviously has implications for teaching because we now need to now prepare our, our students for working uh, with all these uh, telehealth platforms. Good news is it looks like there'll be a need for more psychologists as a result of Um, another implication, a lot of people worked at home during the COVID pandemic, um, and it suggested that won't entirely reverse. I think that means more university staff and students will spend more time working at home, which I generally think is a good thing. But given that I do do research on social support, and I'm currently trying to get funding for a research centre for decreasing loneliness, increasing social support, I would simply point out there are issues with people spending more time working at home. Um, there's also likely to be an increase in blended learning. I can't resist throwing in here that I've always had this uh, hobby horse for many years that I think there's a tremendous opportunity which has never been exploited in developing like business education modules where the idea is each of the topics that are covered in lectures or workshops will actually be covered by leading experts in the field. Um, I'd like to see universities come together uh, on, on that basis. So all the lectures you get in the course are not all from one university, they're from the leading experts. Um, final suggestion with respect to teaching, I, I, I just mentioned this very, very briefly. I just, I do, student feedback, you know, it first began, I don't know, it'd been about the, the 80s, 90s, certainly well after I finished as a student. I think it's been responsible for enormous improvement in teaching. It doesn't all, I personally think it's all got to be carried away now. Where there's a danger that lecturers are more worried about getting good ratings and good experiences. It takes away this idea that the, the, that the learning environment is an interactive one, not uh, the lecturer performing and the students evaluating. Um, so I'm running out of time, so just let me just say, so in summary, I think the three big challenges are the review of the pathways, the changes to the funding model, and COVID driven changes like student numbers. I don't think there are any easy solutions, but there are opportunities. And just a couple of general comments, I do think there's a need to be really strategic, flexible, and creative, and proactive rather than reactive. And I'll say that because academics are extremely intelligent, but they can be a bit conservative. This isn't the time for being conservative, it's the time for being more The solution might vary from relatively subtle changes like um, organizational psychology and something else like applied psychology and health, maybe setting up relation uh, programs for ANU, we had a program with Southwest University in China, putting two million dollars into the university every year, putting a million into the school budget. And frankly, the amount of time we had we had put in was very, very little. So as stated at the beginning, that was the year that was. And I just wanted to mention originally I was supposed to talk about my research. My main area of research is headache and migraine, and the main thing that I've been doing, focused on in recent years, is the triggers of headache and migraine, particularly how they acquire the capacity to precipitate headaches, how that capacity can be extended. So that, for example, the standard advice to individuals suffering from migraine has always been the best way to prevent an attack is to avoid the triggers, but I've developed a model that says, um, actually, you may be a chronic headache sufferer because you keep trying to avoid and avoidance leads to sensitization or tolerance. My form of trigger management involves reverse exposure to some triggers to the body. Just thought I'd throw that in in case anyone in the panel discussion would want to discuss uh, headache migraine. Okay, thanks, David. Thank you very much, Paul, for, for those insights. I think um, one thing that really struck me from your talk was when you looked at those three challenges, it really shows that um, psychology as a discipline and the way we teach psychology doesn't exist in a vacuum. You know, we are influenced by outside forces 
whether it's the government and funding, whether it's the COVID-19 situation, whether it's accreditation or whatever it may be, you know, there's always going to be these outside players that we need to be responsive to and can influence what we do. But I guess at the end of the day, we just need to hold firm in terms of the way we want to teach and the way we want to work with students in terms of that learning experience. So thank you very much for your insight on those things. And I think this is a perfect sort of segue through to our panel discussion, where we're going to be looking at some of those more specific issues around the teaching of psychology. So I'd just like to first introduce our four uh, panel guests. Uh, the first one is Dr. Matt Stainer. And Dr. Matt Stainer is a cognitive psychologist and lecturer here in the School of Applied Psychology. So as an expert in cognitive psychology and methodology such as eye tracking, Matt's research has a particular focus on applying this method to a broad set of applied domains. So Matt is very passionate about learning and about how new technologies can be used to assist delivery. Uh, Jacinta Hallgood uh, also joins us on the panel today. Jacinta has worked with our research institute, so that's the Australian Institute of Suicide Research and Prevention, since the year 2000. And she's developed, delivered, and evaluated suicide prevention training for the suicide prevention sector in Australia. Jacinta is also the program director for the graduate certificate in suicidology, as well as the master of suicidology programs. Our third speaker uh, is Professor Sharon Dor on the panel. Sharon is a clinical psychologist and an academic in our school. Now she's worked in academic settings for over 25 years and has an international reputation in the field of child and family studies, child maltreatment and child development. Now among her very many achievements is the development of PUP, which stands for Parenting Under Pressure. And this is an evidence-based program that has assisted parents and families across the nation and internationally. And finally, our school has always believed in the student voice and that teaching involves that partnership between the student and the teacher. And as such, I'd like to introduce Lee Chantal Koch, who this year has been studying for her Bachelor of Psychology Honours degree. So having experience as an international speaker, a consultant, an author, and now soon to be Griffith Honours graduate, we're very interested to hear Lee Chantel's thoughts on what is exciting about studying psychology at this point in time, and also what the future holds for our students. So welcome to our four panel guests. And I guess if our panel guests can just turn on their video, and that way we can um, engage in this discussion. So I'll, I've got a couple of questions that I'd like to ask of our panel guests and also um, a few things as well that um, we can incorporate from the audience. So if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, write those questions in the chat and then um, we can ask the, the panel guests in order to um, answer those questions. Now, I will turn first to uh, Dr. Matt Stainer in terms of the first question. So Matt, we've seen you know, some changes this year in terms of the way we teach psychology. Um, notwithstanding all of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, what do you see are the most important changes that's happening in how we teach psychology? Thanks, David. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's kind of hard to remove COVID entirely because I think it yeah. has forced us to reflect quite a lot on the way that we can teach using technology. Um, and certainly this year we've had a lot of things forced upon us. Some of them have gone gone very well other things have been a bit more challenging um, so I think certainly the future will be looking at integrating technology both in probably in the way we teach and also what we teach um, you know Griffith has made its stance very clear on its interest in tackling some of the big issues in society um, with their beacons and spotlights for example that they're funding so um, you know in, in psychology I think we've got lots of issues that are are relatively modern to do with the way that we interact with technology and the way we, we engage with technology. Um, Paul was discussing earlier telehealth and we have some some research experts here as well and I know that's being integrated into our teaching um, as a different way of, of working with with people and that you know probably was coming but has been pushed on by by COVID. 
Um, and, you know, things like cyberbullying, the way that people interact with each other online, um, it doesn't really seem like Melania Trump has been able to fix it in the last four years. So it's still an issue that's going to be something we're going to need to think about training uh, our undergraduates to think about. So I think probably there are new challenges coming up that we're going to need to be thinking about. Um, yeah. I might, so I might just sort of interrupt you there in terms of the, the technology that's really emerging as a, a dominant theme here. I might just bring in Jacinta. So Jacinta, you have developed the STARS program, which is the suicide risk assessment tool. And that was a tool where it's involving uh, teaching people how to use STARS. And you've developed that tool through face-to-face um, -face workshops, teaching people how to use it through face-to-face -face workshops. But now you're developing it so it can be taught through a more blended approach, which involves the use of technology as well as face-to-face. Just wonder if you could share some of your sort of um, learnings, I guess, in terms of that transition from face to face to incorporating more technology. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, so, so we're yet to officially launch and enrol, which will be early next year. However, um, yeah, look, in, in being able to put it together, we've learned or taken lessons at least from our online suicidology programs, which have been online since 2004. Um, so we've taken some lessons from there. The, the biggest lessons have really been about how do we you, how do we transform what is essentially a clinical skills based teaching to a digital platform uh, mm -hmm. and do justice to a lot of the learning outcomes that we're kind of espousing. And um, so I think the best um, little I guess avenues for that have come for us for us through panel discussions with lived experience uh, and really mm -hmm. using real world uh, and hypothetical actors etc um, to integrate the theory that we're translating uh, together with just real world experiences and then help bridge that with some more little activities so a bit very different to the face-to-face -face. Uh, and then mm -hmm. the, the skills-based assessment components will of course be done in a more face-to-face -face day format Hmm. The real world is, is certainly a, a vital element of that and I guess nothing gets more real when you're dealing with um, children in families. So I might just call upon Sharon to um, give us some of her thoughts and reflections in terms of you know, the way we teach because you know we, we speak mainly about teaching psychology at Griffith which is within a higher education institution so it's a very formal approach but what is it like when you're trying to teach parents some of those really practical strategies to deal with their children. Sharon. Well, that's a really good question. And uh, uh, one of the things I think that has been very interesting in the field is that we've moved away from this notion of a skills-based approach to parenting, where you teach parents how to construct a, re a reward chart or a star chart and how you punish children for misbehavior, to something that's actually I think much more interesting, which is around outcomes for children. And so if you say your end goal is for children to be the best that they can be, that means children having good self-regulation. Mm -hmm. And so then it becomes a question of working with parents to work out what it is that helps children develop self, good self-regulation. And along the way, that's about teaching a language around how to label your emotions. But equally, parents need to know how to label their own emotions. Mm. And once you can label your own emotions, you need strategies for working out how to calm down or how to recognize when you're getting wound up. And that's all for good child self-regulation, but it's really critical for parents to be able to do that as well. So a lot of the approach that we use in our Parents Under Pressure program is actually working more with parents than parents ever really quite realise. Mm. And I guess that comes as a real sort of shock to a few of the parents. Well, you don't ever really, you know, sometimes you get to the end of working with a family and parents say in a curious kind of way, oh, um, I've got much better self-regulation myself as well. And you go, oh, really? <laughs> That's good to hear. So you, uh, you you almost do, sometimes we even call it sneaky pup, but you, you almost do, um, uh, you're working with the parents to help them support their kids to develop self-regulation. And in so doing, they have to come on that journey themselves. 
Thank you very much. Now let me turn to Lee Chantel, who is our, I guess, student representative on this panel. Uh, Lee Chantel, you know, what does teaching psychology and psychology education actually mean to you? So as a student. I guess um, there's a lot of new things that we can um, learn from or go towards. Like I'm very interested in cyber psychology, for example. And um, this year uh, with my honours, I did mixed methods and multidisciplinary research. So I'm really interested in how um, like the teamwork and the collaborative aspects of um, multidisciplinary research can happen. So that's sort of the areas that I'm interested in. Hmm. So you think using online technologies can really help with that multidisciplinary approach to learning? Well, for example, my um, honours thesis this year, um, we used a now humanoid social robot and I worked with Michelle Newman from Education. And yeah, the, it's interesting, all these new technologies and in particular, um, robotic and interactive technologies with people and children that's very interesting and we also I think have to put those newer technologies into better use in the way that education and learning online is used as well. Mm -hmm. Now that's really good thoughts. Now we've heard a lot about technology, 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 technology is you know is this all going to be the future in terms of psychology and the way we teach? You know, what, what do students want? What do students want? Well, yeah. um, I think this, this year in particular with, um, with um, honours, it was a pretty crazy year and then add COVID onto it as well. I think connection is really important. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that a lot because it was a stressful year. And I felt that the um, just putting what we were doing on like in person onto onto online, um, there was quite a few things that maybe needed to be adapted in a better way because they're not similar. There's quite a few differences, and mm -hmm. um, you know, for example, a lot of the tools that are used like wikis, blogs, and forums, they're static, they're formal, they're not encouraging connection and that we need that connection um, to um, also for learning. It helps our learning and it helps us know that we're not just in the honours thing alone. We've got other people that are going through the same sort of thing. So yeah, I think more interactive, collaborative and um, participatory aspects to online teaching is really necessary. And I really liked um, a few of my subjects had breakout rooms. So that's a really good example of how to use the online technologies for teaching in a good way because you are, you're applying the learning that you've done and you're also in the smaller groups encouraging that connection. So I think that's a really good example of how to do it well. Yeah, breakout room. Now, Matt, um, what other ways in which can we have um, increased connection? amongst students, but also amongst the teacher and the student. So how can we increase that aspect of connection, particularly in the current approaches for teaching psychology? Yeah, look, I think um, there seems to be a lot of support for these kind of blended mode deliveries. And I think, you know, it is important to make sure that the benefits that can be achieved of having things online um, don't lose their sense of connection, because I think, you know, that is one of the reasons that students enjoy their time certainly for, for me at university i got a lot out of it and also that that sense that you are not um that you're not alone and that sometimes the things that take a little bit longer to sort of get your head around are things that everyone is is feeling as well um, certainly this year in the statistics courses for example we had our past sessions um and i think they were an opportunity um, albeit still online an opportunity for students to be able to at least engage with each other in a different sense and i think that is something that um, just has to be has to be maintained because we don't want to create these siloed students who are all you know by themselves online. You know, it's, it's great that we can offer greater flexibility by having people zoom in or um, join collaborates and things. But um, I think it's important to make sure we whatever happens, we do not lose those senses of connection because um, you know do, doing a degree would be a very lonely place if we lose that. Mm, definitely. Now, Sharon, you're a, an expert in, in the clinical psychology sense, but also, you know, a lot of knowledge around, you know, relationships, particularly within family context, but also 
um, in, a, in a broader context. So just interested in your thoughts around this theme that's just emerging here around the need for, have, for having connection, you know, particularly when you're using technology or particularly when people are studying and working from home. It's an enormous challenge. Um, I'm not saying anything that anybody doesn't already know or has have experienced. And uh, I think certainly in the work that we've been doing, um, trying to help people understand how to use some of the technology has been a really major challenge. Um, and many of the um, families that we work with and even the agencies I work, we work with don't have the infrastructure for um, accessing technology. So even before we start talking about how do you remain connected, we actually have a really significant problem around accessing just the rudimentary um, IT. Hmm. And then having gone beyond that, there is something really both challenging, but also kind of interestingly helpful about uh, the distance of, of technology. There's something about the anonymity of turning your camera off that poses huge challenges for us when we're teaching students and we're talking to a blank screen for us when we're, we're in meetings and cameras are off. Um, interestingly, David, there's also, I've had experiences where I actually feel like people have disclosed almost a little bit more with their camera off. There's something about the anonymity of it, almost a little bit like a telephone helpline. So, you know, I think we've got challenges around engagement, but I'm not entirely sure that it's all bad news. Um, and that somewhere in the complexity of maintaining connectedness and supporting people emotionally, there are times when it's actually kind of almost therapeutic to say it's okay to turn the camera off. So mm. that's really interesting. You also hear sometimes about you know the stranger on the plane type of situation where you'll have someone next to you and they'll tell you the whole life story because they're not going to see you ever again. So yeah. Um, I might just ask Jacinta, because Jacinta, you um, as Program Director for the Master of Suicidology Programs, that um, is a highly regarded program, which is an online program. So it's taught, you know, through an online modality. So I guess through that program, all the work you've been doing to develop it, you've actually, you know, solved, I guess, a lot of these problems in terms of connecting with students and students working together. So have you found any strategy or strategies in particular that you've found really useful in this regard? Well, I think uh, Sharon makes a good point. We have found since enhancing even more so some of the online connection with students through COVID um, that when people can chat and put their little messages in chat, et cetera, they'll disclose more. Uh, a lot of this probably has to do with the fact that 50% of our students have lived experience of suicide, uh, no matter what profession they're from. So it does allow that kind of level of anonymity. Um, but also, yeah, look, um, I think we've got so much more to solve, but uh, the engagement element, I think, allows people to be flexible. So we've noticed that people can entertain at any time of the day or night the opportunity to learn so they can have their coffee. I'm sure everyone's experienced this just with working from home. Um, they can, you know, do their washing, have coffee, etc. They can they can achieve learning. Um, and then there's set times when they can engage with their peers. So that's always the, the feedback that we get. Um, and it also encourages us as lecturers, I think, when it's online to uh, place a bit more emphasis on how you engage. Whereas if you're face to face, you probably don't worry as much about how you frame the wording to how you provide feedback or deliver a message. So um, that's something else that we found has been really well received, trying to pay a bit more attention to that level of teaching mechanism. Excellent. Yeah, that sounds really good. Now, I'm aware of time, and I just do want to um, focus on one, uh, one other aspect in relation to teaching. And, and Lee Chantel, I'll, I'll ask you first of all, uh, research. Well, research is very important in psychology. Um, it's an evidence-based practice. You completed an honours degree uh, when you did a research project and you're looking to uh, begin your PhD in psychology. Now, can I just ask you, what role does sort of research have in terms of learning about psychology as a discipline? Um, research, I guess um, for me, 
I found it really interesting to actually be more hands-on this year. So maybe in the past it was a bit more abstract. So I definitely found that the research element of doing it and working out um, some of the things myself, like I'd never done in-person data collection, never coded the videos before. So working out how to do those things with, um, you know, the, the stuff that you'd learned previously with stats. You know, stats is definitely not my forte. So that was quite a challenge for me. But, um, yeah, I felt that it was when I was learning more, and I, okay, I don't necessarily understand this or I need to do more about this, um, learning that and applying those things myself on a, my own sort of project was really important. And I also think, like I mentioned at the beginning with the multidisciplinary aspect, I like I love the teamwork aspect and learning from other disciplines and other people's opinions. So, for example, education comes from a totally different mindset than psychology does. They do things in a different way from how they analyse things to the subject pool to the write-up. So that was really interesting to learn. Okay, so that's what they do and this is what we do. So how do you merge those two together or what, what sort of wins over? Or, and, um, yeah, that's really important to me. I think it's really important to work with, them, with other disciplines to um, learn more and to just evolve psychology more. And in particular, when we're getting into the newer areas like cyber psychology, that's, you know, working psychology and ICT. So, and there's all these other elements and all these other disciplines that, can come in. So I think that's really important with research going mm. forward. You mentioned statistics and that's sort of something which, you know, <laughs> is obviously an important aspect of research. But I was interested to hear when you mentioned about, you know, you really got to get hands on in terms of, you yeah. know, immersing yourself, um, doing the statistics, collecting the data, interpreting the data, you know, is such a rich learning experience. Um, so I think that's really, really insightful. And I'll just turn to Matt now because Matt um, is one of the um, staff in our school who teaches a lot of statistics, first year level and second year level and postgraduate level. So you've got a lot of experience, Matt, in terms of you know, how to teach statistics successfully and how people learn statistics successfully. So what do you think you know, the future has in store in terms of the way we might learn about you know, research and methodologies and statistics? Yeah, look, I think um, so much of our information now comes from various sources of various credibility that there's just an important uh, in the ability to interpret um, what we're being told. You know, there's all these little echo chambers online. You can go and find evidence for whatever you want. So I think really um, a lot of the skills that we're teaching in, in statistics are so general and probably generally very employable skills for our undergraduates. And to be able to go and, you know, not just do research, but also to be able to make sense of all of the information that you are given and whether or not it's good information, whether or not it's been done well, whether or not there are problems with methodologies and things. So I think, you know, um, beyond the idea of going and being a researcher in the end, if you're going to go and be a clinician, you should be able to read a paper and understand whether or not it's telling you good things for how you're going to inform your own practice. Um, but just generally, if you can, you know, if someone's telling you something, you should be able to at least uh, be able to be critical of it and be able to look at it with a critical eye um, and a fair eye as well. And I think that's probably something that we can broadly teach, not just in statistics, but across all of the different subjects we teach. Hmm. And like Lee, what Lee Chantel was mentioning as well in terms of interdisciplinary practice as well. So being, being understanding, being respectful of different disciplines and the way they might approach the problem is also an important part of that too. Yes, I mean, I think we're all sort of uh, becoming more and more connected and psychology plays a role in so many different areas. I know that, you know, further up through the degree, we do a lot of opportunities for people to go and work in different areas and see how your skills translate. And I think a lot of those lateral thinking skills about, well, you know, I'm learning about this, but how can I apply it in different ways um, are going to be very useful for our graduates going forward as well to make them more employable in the workplace and also to realise job opportunities they may not think about otherwise. Hmm. Hmm. Really good points there. Now, Sharon, if I just uh, could, could turn to you now, um, you've obviously have um, a wealth of experience in terms of teaching at um, a whole range of levels from large class teaching to a small group and individual one-on-one -on -one supervision. Do you think there are any 
sort of real kernels of vital, you know, um, advice I guess you could give in terms of the way we might either teach or the way we might learn about psychology. You know, forget all this technology and all that kind of stuff. You know, what sort of if we boil it down to the bare bones, you know, what's your advice on how we should approach things? Cool. You know, I think it's about theory. Really, it's about having an understanding of what the theoretical model is and being able to really clearly articulate the various connections between your theoretical models. Um, and I think the more that we can do that in psychology, the more we can draw on multi method approaches. So, if we were wanting to know, for example, um, what uh, does having a sensitive mum or dad help children's emotion regulation? We are already articulating a theoretical model, a relationship between parental sensitivity and child emotion regulation. Um, and in so doing, we can then draw from a whole range of different approaches. We can videotape uh, and code. Uh, we can put little heart rate monitors on children to have a look at their heart rate variability. So, um, I think having a really good understanding of the theoretical model then allows us to be enormously creative with the way in which we can test um, hypotheses that are generated. Hmm. Now that's really good. And, and theories, I guess, are also general. So it allows you to apply that theory in a range of areas rather than being tied to a specific sort of context as well. Now I want Lee Chantel to have the final word. In, in our panel discussion here. Um, so, Lee Chantel, Sharon mentioned theory as very important in terms of learning psychology and the way we might teach psychology. I'm um, just interested in your thoughts about that or whether you have anything uh, to add or maybe uh, a, a, another thing that you might suggest. Um, with the theory, I definitely agree with that. And it's just, I guess, finding which theory fits sometimes. So, because I was doing this year, um, uh, human robot interaction was the theory and then specifically for child human robot interaction but because it's a very very new area there's a lot of stuff that um, is maybe not to the level that we would have it in psychology in regards to the research output and um, what you can um, you know draw from the conclusions so that you know it's very interesting to work out what is really um, usable or what's not in regards to research which is based on the theory but I'd, I'd also like to say um, David there's some challenges that um, with the online stuff and I think that comes down to I don't know if it's necessary personality or confidence that people have so for example with the online stuff I've noticed you know, there's self-regulated learning. Like, do people do people think you can actually learn online? Is one, and are people self-effective with technology? Like, if they don't have confidence in the technology, it's going to be hard for them to learn in that way. And there's always going to be accessibility tech issues, distraction, and privacy yeah. issues as well. Yeah. So I think it's like really important yeah. to have clear understandings of what is expected from each person involved and to have clear boundaries to separate your personal and your professional. And I think they would help going forward with um, you know, the next 30 years of teaching psychology. Hmm. And I think that's really good. I think that's really good. Our panel discussion. Our panel discussion. Our panel discussion. Psychology at Griffith. Um, so at this point, I just would like to thank all of our guest speakers that um, spoke today. Uh, for our session from John O'Gorman, Annalisa Donovan, Paul Martin, and our four panel speakers as well. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the contributions from our school engagement committee, which organised this session, and in particular, the chair of the committee, um, Professor uh, Mark Kebbell, and also the assistance of Chantal Coward, who helped organise all of this wonderful sort of, you know, technology and uh, invitations and so on around this. So thank you both Mark and thank you Chantal for your contributions. And with that, I will think we will end the session here. And I'd just like to thank everyone for coming along and uh, for contributing to the discussion today. And I hope you found it um, an interesting discussion and also some thought provoking things for the future as well.
Thank you.